We know that Jesus said to suffer the little children, come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. And he took them up in his arms and he put his hands upon them and he blessed them. And we talk about, uh, when we do talk about a baby dedication, we talk about covenants. And covenants that are made in a baby dedication uh, come from Scripture, which tells us to remember, you know, to these promises that we make to each other are sacred and holy. A covenant is a binding uh, commitment, a promise that is made. The first one is made by God when it says, The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon those who fear Him, and His his righteousness is upon His children's children. Uh, So it's such to keep His covenant and to those that remember His commandments. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 14, it says, It is not the will of the Father which is in heaven that one of the little ones should perish. He loves and cares for His children. The second covenant is made by the parents. In these words, it says, uh, I command unto you that this day they shall be in your heart, that you shall teach my commandments diligently to your children. You shall talk to them about me when you sit down in your home, when you take walks with them, when you lie down to sleep, and when you wake up in the morning. And as we say all the time, almost always. The third is made by the church, the household of God. The responsibility of bringing up this child in the fear and admonition of the Lord is not just the parents alone, because we're a part of that as a church family. Proverbs 22, 6 rings true today. To train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. We here at Faith Chapel must do all we can to help nurture this child. We must watch after her and pray for her and encourage her in the ways of the Lord. I love to think about how when we come to dedicate a baby, it is just a surrendering of this child to the absolute will of God. Zonk and Darcy and presenting Raina before the Lord for dedication. Do you confess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you acknowledge that your duty to bring her up in the admission of the Lord, that she may later of her own, her own free accord and her choice confess her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and accept Him as her personal Savior, uniting with the church through baptism and dedicating yourself to the service of God? If so, please answer by saying, we do. We still have another responsibility in addition to surrendering Raina to God. Just as Moses was given back to his, his mother, Jochebed, so Raina will be given back to you to be raised for God. We need to listen to God in prayer to see what it is that the Lord might be saying to you uh, and to her and to listen to the will of God, even sometimes if it conflicts from ours, that God may choose for her uh, His perfect will. To all of you in the congregation, our part of helping uh, with this task for Raina is just beginning. We've covenanted together with Razak and Darcy to help nurture Raina in the ways of God, to be an example of the love of God, and to do everything you can to protect her and care for her in Christ. If so, please ask. Amen. This time I'm going to present flowers to you as symbols. So Razak, I'm going to start with you, and I want to give you this red rose as a symbol. This red rose is a symbol to remind you of the love that God showed when he gave his son Jesus to the world as a sacrifice for our sin. Let it remind you to let nothing enter your home that will weaken or destroy the faith of your family. And let nothing enter your home that in any way will injure the soul and the heart of this precious little girl. And Darcy, I'm going to give you this symbol of the white rose. The white rose represents the purity of heart and purpose with which you endow your home into which this precious little Raina has come. From the purity of your eyes comes the the idea that God is holy. From the gentleness of your voice, the idea that God is love. Raina, I have a little flower for you. You want daddies? Let me give you that one. How about that? You get a nice little one to go right into your mouth. Hey, it's a plant. It's healthy, right? You're fearfully and wonderfully made, white, innocent, and pure. And she's chowing on that, baby. (laughs) Kai, I'm going to give you one, too. How about that? And Zara, you get one, and you get one, because you guys are the big sisters, and you're the big brother, and you're innocent and fearfully and wonderfully made, too. (laughs) Love those flowers. Still picking flowers out of her mouth. It's always a little risk. A little risky. That's all right. She's now a flower girl, dropping her petals, right? You got a mouthful of flowers. You can eat that if you want. 
Oh, let's join together in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for Raina. Thank you for all that you do, Lord, in Razak and Darcy's life. Thank you for her siblings, Lord. Thank you for all that you do. We thank you, God, that as we surrender back to you, this child, Lord, that you would bless her, give her a great life in you, centered around the good things of God. We thank you for all you do. We love you, God, and we praise you. Bless her in Jesus' name. Amen. Say amen. Amen. <laughs> we have some gifts for you, for her, for you guys to remember this day. There's a Bible and some keepsakes and a letter for her to open up when she's 13. 2032, yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> Let's give him a hand, folks. <laughs> Tonner's going to come in just a moment and bring the word, and not just as an ordained minister, but uh, as my wife, she brings such great uh, words to us of encouragement. She will be very comfortable walking on the stage today because this is what happens. I lay flowers on her feet at home every day. She'll just come up here and just be like every day, but uh, let her know how much you appreciate her this morning, because I do. Back there, that big thing. I'm just going to follow your example. <laughs> Clock what? It's the anointing. It's the anointing. What can I say? <laughs> Holy Spirit, what? Yeah. Have you ever gone to the grocery store to get a cart? And you get one and it starts wobbling, like all wobbly. What do you do? Put it back, right? Get another one? Or does some of you think, I'm going to beat this thing, and you try to stay with it, right? I put it back. I know, surprising, competitive me. I put it back. I'm not messing with it. Or maybe you've had a time where you feel a little bit out of sync, like things just aren't lining up right, and you feel like you're off. You don't know what's causing it. Maybe it's a mood or a feeling. Maybe it's a situation or a relationship. You're just kind of in a funk. You just kind of can't get through this. You feel kind of down, depressed, whatever, just this blah. Last week, I saw a friend, hadn't seen for a few days probably, and walked up to her and said, hey, how's it going? Good. He said, how are you? Good. And I said, no, you're not. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I said, what's wrong? Nothing. No, 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 no. What's wrong? Nothing. I'm fine. I go, mm, yeah, no, I can see it. It's like, I don't know. And I said, well, I can just see it. It's just sort of, you're just off. Later that day, she texted me and she goes, it's just kind of crazy that you can just, like, know something's wrong. I don't even know what's wrong. How do you do that? I've been told I'm a little creepy like that. <clears throat> but, you know, hey, you've got the spirit helping you. It's all right. For most of us, though, if you've been driving for very long, maybe you haven't had any off days. You're one of those people that you don't get off. You don't find yourself depressed or out of sorts or in a funk or tired. You just, hey, life is good and everything's great. Wow. I'd like to uh, note your seat. But, uh, but, but, you know, if you, you don't have that or you don't ever get the job, shopping cart, maybe you don't go to the grocery store, lucky you. Um, I found the time to go Saturday when there's snowstorms. <laughs> I went yesterday, I was like, did the rapture come? <laughs> a little scary. <laughs> but if you've been driving for a while, you know that even your car needs some help. Sometimes you're driving and you might have a flat tire or you let go of the wheel and it sort of veers off one way and you're thinking, okay, something's wrong, it might be a flat tire, it might be something messed up. And so you take it in, you get the tire fixed, maybe you get two tires fixed, and that's fine, but maybe it still sort of veers off to the right because it's not lined up. And you can fix the tire and replace it, fix the alignment. You can keep driving it that way. And after a while, more things happen, and it causes more damage to your car, and you have to have more money that you spend. That's the extent of my car experience. Um, 
knowledge, but, but that's what I know. Not from personal experience, but that's what I know. And, and the same thing's true with our lives. If we don't, you know, we have a flat tire sometimes. We have things that throw us off, and we find ourselves out of line in our thinking or our attitude or the way we feel about somebody or something, or when something happens to us or it surprises us or it, or it disappoints us. My heart, my mind, my attitude, my behavior can get all out of alignment, and it needs an adjustment. You hear people say you need an attitude adjustment. I mean, I can keep going. But after a while, I'm not good for much of anything or anybody, and much less myself. And I get caught up in this funk, in this sense where I'm way off course and trying to figure it out. And three or four weeks ago, I was beginning to plan ahead a little bit for this message. It's a big surprise, right? <laughs> but uh, I was praying, I was reading, I was wanting to be clear about the Lord, what the Lord wanted me to share. And almost immediately, the word alignment came to me. I jotted it down, and I just kept kind of seeking. And I was also thinking about the fact that it's the beginning of the year, and sometimes people pick a New Year resolution. I don't, but some people do. And, uh, but other people, like, they'll pick a word. I don't do that either, but some of you do. But and I was beginning to see these new the words for the year. So I'm thinking about this message. I'm thinking, okay, I need a word. I want a good word, right? So I'm trying to think about that and figure out how that's going to be. And... Um, an expectation I set up for myself. I was looking for my word, for my theme, for today's message, this second Sunday of the new year. You know, it's this expectation that I have. I want to share something relevant that sounds good. And yes, I go through some crazy things when I'm preparing a sermon. Don't judge me. It takes me a while to get myself and my own concerns and my own thoughts out of the way so the Lord can really kind of help me here. And I need to hear first, most of the time, what he's trying to tell me. You just get to come along on my journey. But I'd try other topics, and I'd read supporting scripture, and somehow I was led back to alignment. And this can't, went on for two or three weeks, or a couple weeks, I guess. And I just kept kind of thinking, why can't my word be like joy, or endurance, or hope, or connection, or something happy? I was happy for the new year. I don't know. And, uh, but it wasn't. And several years ago, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, Pastor Bob preached a series, and he talked about we have to agree first so that we can be aligned with God and his will on earth so that we can then be lined up to accept whatever assignment he's got for us. And I'm often reminded of that in my own time, and he reminds us of that sometimes. And I was reminded of that even during my time preparing for this morning, and I was still not going to do alignment. Clearly, you can see God won. <laughs> We're here. Obviously, I gave in. But as if I needed more convincing, last week I ran into my friend who was a little off, and I was thinking, okay, she's a little out of line, you know, needs a little help. And, and then I had to get a new tire on my car, and they had to do the alignment. And so I was like, all right, all right, all right, I got it. I got it. So alignment. If we're going to look at alignment, I want to define it and think about it, because when something's aligned, it's arranged in a straight line or in correct or appropriate relative position. Another definition is that it's in a position of agreement. So this morning I want to talk about being aligned with God, and if and when we fall out of line, what might cause it, how to reconnect. I'm sure I'm not going to tell you anything new. I'm not going to give you any real revelation that you've never heard before if you've spent a Sunday in church, if you know anything about Christ, but maybe I'll remind you of something. Maybe I'll encourage you. Maybe I'll tweak for you something that says, uh, okay, you're speaking to me, Lord. I've been ignoring. Maybe you've been ignoring this whole thing for a few days like I did. But for starters, we have to be sure that our heart is aligned. The world says follow your heart. The problem is we might chase whatever feels right at the moment, in whether it's right or not. And see, our heart is unreliable. Feelings and emotions can overtake us. They can be shallow. They can be indecisive. They can be in the moment. They change depending on the circumstances. And what feels right at the height of those emotions and those decisions we make later feels like a really big mistake. 
Proverbs 28, 26 says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Another translation says, Those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. From our heart, we might have impure thoughts or feelings or uh, fear, anxiety, doubt, confusion, all kinds of things, uncertainty. If we dwell in those places too long, we can begin to feel a little off and out of sync. Things aren't lined up. And it's easy to dwell in those places a little too long, isn't it? Just a little bit. Lisa Turkhurst said, where we stare, we steer. That can have us veering off to the right or to the left. What are we staring at? What do we have our eyes fixed on or our heart or our mind or our thoughts, our behaviors? Life is hard. Life is stressful. So many things are out of our control. Things like the attack on Iran that can create for us some fear and anxiety. It can kind of get us a little anxious. Things like tragedy that strikes, or illness, or we lose our job. Maybe there's financial pressure, struggles in our relationships, or maybe we're just tired or burnt out or overwhelmed. Maybe the weather gets to us, kind of tugs us, pulls us away. And it takes its toll on us. And no matter how strong your faith is, or how long you've been a Christian, or how much you go to church, or how much you read your Bible, or how much you pray we can easily get thrown out of alignment. It doesn't take much for me. Okay, I don't hear too many of you saying, yeah, I get you, so I'll preach to me. You're on my journey. Our body can get misaligned. Have you ever stood up and you're like, oh, and you just, like, you know, you're you're messed up. Something's not right. Or you get out of bed in the morning and it's not just because you're stiff, it's like something is just not right. This past August, I went to the doctor. I was feeling a little off. Nothing major. No glaring symptoms. I just didn't feel right. Some said it was stress. I don't get stressed. Get a little overwhelmed. I mean, I don't feel stressed. People are like, how do you handle stress? Great. I don't feel stressed. My body does, obviously. The story I'm going to tell you. So I went to the doctor, and I was sharing some of the symptoms with my doctor, and, I'll, and then I said, oh, wait a minute, let me just back up first, just a minute. Let me tell you a little bit about my life this past year. That might help us understand a few things. So I began August 10th, traumatic, tragic accident. Tim and Jace injuries. I had rotator cuff surgery. And I was in the, the injuries and the accident and our church as a whole and kids on the youth trip and not on the youth trip, all of that. And and things we're dealing with and still are, and rotator cuff surgery, and Rachel passed away, and my mom went in the hospital, and we about lost her, and, and Bob had a heart scan, and that led to a stress test, which he failed, and that led to a heart cath, and that led to, he had rotator cuff surgery, and I'm only at April. And the doctor's like, whoa, okay, 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 stop. And I wanted to say, I'm not done yet. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 I think, there's, I think it's pretty clear why you're off just a little bit, okay? And I said, okay, and I wanted to talk some more. I had some more questions. He asked me a few more questions, and I said, okay, but what about? And he goes, no, and I think we got this. I said, well, like, don't you want blood work? I mean, done anything wrong? He said, you have situational, adult situational stress disorder. Yep. I was like, what? Yep, yep. I don't get stressed. I don't feel stressed. What are you talking about? And so he didn't even give me any pills or anything. He was just like, you just need to lower your stress level. Oh, yeah, sure. Walk outside the door. There's stress. There's things happening, okay? Life's going on. Everyday life can throw us out of sync. It just does. And I know I'm not alone in the room this morning. I can take this microphone, and I can go person to person, and you can share when you've been out of line. Not just in your relationship or something you said that's inappropriate or whatever. When you've been out of sync. Like when, I mean, it might be this morning. You're like, great, okay, can I leave now? Because I don't want to hear any more of this message. I know where this is going. And God's like, nope, you just stay right there. Okay, like kind of like you do with me. Everything had to do with alignment. You could talk about maybe this past week. I greeted someone in Lewisburg this morning. I go, how you doing? Good. I go, have a great, have a good week. Yeah. Wait, no. (laughs) I said, okay, well, at least you're being honest. 
I said, so did you have a good week, and then it went bad, and then it got good, or it went bad, good, bad? Yeah, I don't know, just kind of everything. I mean, we all have it. It happens. Maybe some of you have felt like this wave has overtaken you. You didn't see it coming, and it knocked you down. You might have even thought you were drowning because you just couldn't get up, and you're just tumbling around in it. And when you finally came sputtering up for air, you were trying to figure out where you are and what was happening, and were you facing the ocean? Were you facing the shore? Were you 10 feet away? What, where were you? You were just so out of sorts. Not only do we find ourselves out of alignment mentally or physically or emotionally or in our relationships, but it can happen spiritually. Amen. And that's where we have the difficulty admitting that we're out of line. I have a friend, a good friend who's a pastor. We were in college together. In fact, Pastor Dave and he were roommates their freshman year in college. And his wife, also a very good friend from college, passed away last month from a brain tumor. Since her funeral, he's taking five or six weeks to just rest and grieve and kind of refocus. Just He knows he can't be in the pulpit and ministry, and he's just trying to... He's coming up out of the wave. And we stayed in touch regularly through her decline, and since then, and he emailed me on Monday, and he said he'd spent a lot of time the last three weeks with his kids and grandkids, and he's doing okay. And he said he went to church on Sunday morning to an AG church. He made sure he told me that because he's a Nazarene pastor. <laughs> <laughs> he told me he realized he was so empty spiritually, just numb, nothing. He said, I couldn't respond, couldn't sing, couldn't do anything except just try to absorb. He said, there was nothing. I was so out of sorts, so numb. See, it happens. You and I are going to get out of sync. We're going to be in our heart and mind misaligned, even spiritually. Sometimes we find ourselves out of sync because we've been so involved in pouring out and serving other people, and that's good stuff. But what happens when we're pouring out, we're not taking time to fill. Or like the scripture says, to stay fueled and aflame. And our flame gets down to this little tiny flicker. You ever had those candles or the pillar candles, and you're like, is that wick even lit? Oh, it's there, but you can barely see. I mean, you have to really look deep to see if there's a fire. We find ourselves burned out spiritually and empty and dull as my pastor friend, just void of any feeling or connection to God. The important thing is that as soon as we recognize it, we do our best to refocus and realign our heart with Christ. And it's not the load that breaks us down, but the way we carry it. Because let's be honest, for many of us, the way we carry our load is that we edge God out and we let everything else crowd in and we forget that we have him to bear the burden. His burden is easy. His yoke is light. And it weighs us down and it pulls us right out of alignment with him. And as Christians followers of Jesus, those who have a relationship with him, we need to get back to our good habits of prayer, of being in the word. Maybe you feel a need to fast. Maybe you need to seek counsel. Maybe you need to engage yourself in worship and sing praises. Charles Stanley said, as I worship, my spirit is lifted. There's just something about magnifying the Lord that puts troubles in the right perspective and reminds me nothing is too big for him. Why? Because we align ourselves with him when we allow ourselves to enter into worship of who he is, the one who loves us, knows us, and created us. Alignment. In 2 Kings, when Josiah, the king of Judah, heard God's word for the first time, God saw his response and said, because your heart, your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself and you wept in my presence, I, the Lord, have also heard you. He hears us and he sees us. Let me personalize that. He hears you. And he sees you. He hears you. 
and he sees you. He hears you and he sees you. It doesn't matter if you're in that place this morning, he hears you. Even if you've not uttered a word, he can hear your heart. He sees you. He knows you. And you know what? We know that. We know that. And sometimes we know that, but boy, we are stubborn. And we have a stubborn heart. And we don't want to surrender that. We don't want to submit that because we kind of like having our own little pity party. And we kind of like being over here when we don't really have to have any responsibility because we can't help it. We're just out of line. Things are just a little skewed. They're a little off. I don't know. I'll get around to it. I'll figure it out. Just leave me alone. We like that sometimes. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can use that and it pulls us farther and farther and farther away from Christ. Our stubborn heart, because when we align ourselves with God, it brings us into the place where he begins to put things in order so his kingdom can come into our lives. God begins to bring his power. He reveals to us what his perfect will is so we can start moving forward with clear purpose. When you enter his presence with praise, he enters your circumstance with his power. We're a little bit afraid of that sometimes. What's it going to cost? What's it going to mean? What am I going to have to do? What are people going to think if all of a sudden I'm a Jesus freak or this weird fanatic? So we kind of hold it down low. We can't hide. He sees us. He hears us. He knows us. We are the ones that take the step to move into his presence. One day, Jesus went up to the Mount of Transfiguration to pray, and he took Peter, James, and John with him, as we read in Matthew 17. There, he was transformed into his glorified state, where his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light, and Moses and Elijah appeared before them, and naturally they were afraid. And as they came back down, the story goes on, as they came back down the mountain, the disciples didn't know, but a man who was in desperate need was waiting for them at the bottom of the hill, the mountain. The man they encountered was a dad, a father. He needed a breakthrough for his family. And in Matthew 17, verses 14 to 16, it says, When to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't cure him. No doubt the father's desperate. He loves his son. He doesn't want him to be in pain and to suffer the way he is. The man knelt humbly before Jesus. Did you get that? Again, the posture, humbled before Jesus shared the pain of what his son was going through. He also told Jesus of his efforts to get help. And the man had brought his son to some of Jesus' disciples, and they weren't able to cast the demon out. The dialogue continues, takes place with the disciples afterward, continuing in verse 17 of Matthew 17. It says, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of him, and the child was cured from him that very hour. Another translation says, what a generation. No sense of God, no focus to your lives. How many times do I have to go over this with you? I think that was probably written for me. Okay, one more time. Here we go. Sorry. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately, and they said, why couldn't we cast out the demon? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is aligning ourselves with God, spending time, making sure that we're in his presence, in line with him, right thinking, right heart, right thoughts, right whatever. When the disciples came privately to Jesus and asked, why could we not cast the demon out in a word? Because of your unbelief. Another translation that I really like said, because you're not yet taking God seriously. This is the root for us, isn't it? 
It's the root of the problem for us as well. We want to experience this supernatural power of God. We want to see him move, but we too, like the disciples in this story, get somewhere and we operate in unbelief. We don't yet take God seriously. Even when he shows up and does what we've asked for, because we're expecting God to fix this in a blue dress. And it comes in some chartreuse, crazy thing that we can't even identify. Except we know it's from God. And it's way better, even though it looks a little weirder and a little more messier than what we'd like it to be. I'd like it to be. But he does that. But we still don't believe when we have this need or we're just all out of sorts, that he really cares about us. He sees us and he hears us, even if we don't utter his name. Amen. The power of God's available to you and me, just as it was available to him, this little boy. The problem was not the demon, the problem was the unbelief. The problem for me, for you probably, is not the doubt or the fear, or the confusion or the worry. It's a lack of faith. The skepticism that we really do have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. You mean I can pray for someone to be healed? You mean I can pray and really believe that God's going to provide work for that person? You mean I can pray that God's going to do for me what I need? I really can do that? Yes. But we are so... Ah. So Jesus addressed the unbelief. The first thing he said was, oh, faithless and perverse generation. That might seem harsh, but it's not. Jesus wasn't being mean. Faithless. We're disconnected to God. When I'm disconnected to God, my life looks a little bit like that rope on the left. A lot of frayed edges. And perverse, we're too connected to the world. We have the same problem today. We find ourselves too disconnected from God and too connected to the world and its distractions. And that will always result in unbelief because we get too far away from what lines us up and what centers us. So many alternative voices, so many other distractions, so many false beliefs. And instead of walking in faith, we walk in unbelief and God's kingdom doesn't manifest with power in our lives. And whatever you, miracle you need... It's a byproduct of believing in God and walking in faith and aligning ourselves with the purposes of God and lining up with him. And some will say, okay, but I've prayed for that miracle. God sometimes wants us to wait. Because why? Because in that waiting, we get a little bit closer to the alignment. We get a little bit more in touch with his power. We get a little bit more in touch and tune with his presence. We get a little bit more lined up, and we can take that straight path. And we can steer where we stare, which is on him, and he can lead us and guide us. But we have to take our hands off that steering wheel and trust that. Hello, I like control. But God's already given us everything we need for living a godly life. Psalm 73, my flesh and my heart may fail. Every day is why we're talking about this, when I'm out of alignment. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We don't need to get anything from God. We just need to learn how to walk in alignment with what he gave us when we got saved, which is himself. 2 Peter 1.3 says, Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know him personally and intimately. Think about when you meet somebody. Maybe somebody you have interest in and you want to get to know them even more as a friend or you want to start dating them when you're in that part of your life and, and you want to know them. And what do you do? You spend time together. And you have conversation, and you're in their presence, so you can know a little bit about who they are, and what they think, and what they believe, and what they want, and what their needs are, and how you can have interaction with them, so you can have a healthy, strong relationship. When you're not connected to the person after a while, your relationship suffers. You're a little bit out of sync. You've got to make time. 
in our relationship with God, we have to align the outside with what's on the inside. We have to starve unbelief and feed faith. We don't want to give in to fear, but focus on faith. And I know it's easier said than done. You've all had life-altering things happen or situations that are, seem very life-altering to you. And, 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 and they are. If it affects us, it, it is. And there's a fine line. Pastor Bob's talked about it. We've talked about it before. There's a fine line between fear and faith. But if we can starve that unbelief and we can focus on faith and we can stare where we, you know, stay, staring toward Christ, looking for him, we'll be a little bit, a lot better off. Something else to consider in our story, I think, that applies when the disciples face the crisis because of their unbelief or their misalignment, they were unprepared to deal with the challenge at hand. Notice when Jesus was faced with a crisis, he didn't have to stop and go on a fast. He didn't have to run away for a quick, oh dear, what do I do, and grab his Bible. I mean, he, he knew the will of his father because he's in relationship with him. And he trusted him for guidance. And he was able to surrender all of that. And yes, again, it's easier said than done. But I'm just trying to remind you and me that even if life circumstances have sucked the life right out of you, and they've weakened your faith and caused you to doubt. The Bible tells us if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, be moved, and it will be cast into the sea. Now, I've seen mustard seeds before. I was just a little curious. I had to get my head back around this. So I bought some mustard seeds. Have you seen a mustard seed? If I open this jar, they're going to be everywhere. They're kind of like those little sprinkles that you put on your cupcakes and your cookies. But I think they're even smaller than those. I didn't have any sprinkles because I just finished Christmas and they're all gone. But I was going to try to use a... These are tiny. These are tiny. And the Bible says in God's word, if you have this much faith... This much. I mean, I'm looking at that going, what? Jasper came down from upstairs and he said, he said, what are you doing a mustard seed? I go, that's part of my sermon. I'm talking about faith. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, he goes, man, he goes, those are tiny. Maybe you should open up, like pour it in there, like you really need a lot. And I said, exactly, it's kind of how it is, right? We fail to see that one little tiny faith when a mustard seed. We think, I need to pour. I need to wait a little. I need to pour. I need this whole jar before I even dare, dare move close to God. And in faith, believing, ask him to do something. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of you. Can I say that again? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of you. Now, does that scare you or what? It scares me to death. I'm not saying I'm Jesus or close, but that same power. And when we enter into his presence, that power comes into our lives and into our circumstances. And if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can believe for victory. I mean, we're all excited about the Chiefs today. We're believing for victory. That is nothing compared to what we have when we have faith in Jesus Christ. Can you get excited about that? We have victory because all it takes is a little bit of faith. And we're going to go cheer for the Chiefs and expect them to win. And we're going to be just going like this. And we come to church and we find out that the same power that lived, that raised Jesus from the dead is in me. And we're like, huh, pretty cool. I think it really is for Angie or Gary or somebody over there, not me. You know what I've done? <laughs> you know how out of line I've been this week? You know how many times I lost my temper? You know how many things I said things I shouldn't have to my family? You know how many times I went to Walmart and yelled at that clerk? Oh dear, I'm not going to Walmart now. What'd she look like? Please don't let her know I'm with you. Right? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside you and me. And we align ourselves with God so all the kingdom power in our spirit 
will manifest itself in our body, in our soul, in our mind, in our situations that we're facing. And when that greater alignment comes, your faith arises. And your unbelief diminishes. It dissipates because we're in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the presence of the Lord. And Satan doesn't want that. And Satan's going to pull even harder. You know, your car veers to the left and you're pulling back. He is going to pull even harder. He does not want us to be in that. He does not want the rule and reign of Christ in our life. He does not want us in sync with him. He does not want us aligned with what we know. He does not want us to do what God wants us to do. He wants to keep us out of line and out of sync and not knowing which end is up and feeling like we're just tumbling along. You can take your small mustard seed of faith You can say to your mountain of addiction. You can say to your difficult relationship. You can say to your financial pressure. You can say to your need for a job. You can say to your health. You can say to your past. You can say to your future. You can say to your uncertainty. You can say to your fear. You can say move. And you know what? It may not happen in that moment, but it will happen because you have faith. But because it doesn't happen in that moment, we don't go right back over here out of line. We stay in line. We stay with that faith. And the more we pray, and the more we believe, and the more we trust, the more our faith grows and our unbelief dissipates. And God will show us that it can move, and it will move. It doesn't matter how big or how small. Sometimes we think, I'm not going to talk to God about this. It's not a big deal. It's no big deal. I'm just a little tired, a little off. Adult situational distress disorder, stress disorder, whatever it is. I didn't get any medical help. I felt like I went out of therapy session, which was good to know that I was suffering from stress. But I just think, oh, I don't need to talk to God about that. It's not a big deal. I'm going to go away tomorrow. he will be fine. I just need eight hours of sleep instead of two. I'll be fine. That's how Satan wants us to stay there. But it takes time. I have a friend in California years ago, I'll never forget. He sent out 584 resumes. He had 583 no's. That takes some faith to keep sending out those resumes. But God says, if you have faith, little tiny mustard seed, if you want to take one of these home, you might lose it before you get, before I even give it to you, it'll drop on the floor. But if you want to take one of these home as a reminder, or just go buy the little thing, $1.50. Got the whole jar right there to remind you. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say, get out of my way because you're causing me to be out of line with my God, my Father. You're causing me to doubt. You're causing me to lose faith. You're causing me to, to fear. The point is, Jesus says, the faith of a tiny mustard seed can overcome the obstacles in our lives. Those obstacles that threaten us to throw us off, leave us in a funk, leave us trying to do life on our own. Hello, guilty. With this faith, you can believe for a breakthrough. And the believing, though, again, can I remind you, God's timing is perfect. I want it yesterday. He said, you got to go through a few more things. It's going to be a little bit more, a little more, a little more issue. No, no, not yet, not yet. But God, do you not? Yes, I see you. But God, I understand. But God, after a while, we can, we, some of us, we just quit arguing and we say, okay, forget it. The whole butt guy, he didn't care. But God, he's, he wants us to have such Close relationship. Because he has perfect timing, as we wait, we continue to believe and not a time of waiting to pull us out of alignment with him, but to take God seriously. Because we haven't taken God seriously yet. At his word, his promise. Nothing, nothing we can tackle, can't tackle when we have faith in Christ and we align ourselves to him. I'm going to ask the worship team to come.
Thank you. I'm not done, so no, just kidding. I feel like I need a shower. Whew.